Not only will we be talking a bit later about the inauguration tomorrow, but we will be talking with Zach Exley. Zach is uh, one of the uh, um, longtime leading uh, thinkers and doers in the space of digital politics. Uh, most recently, he is the co-author of the book uh, Rules for Revolutionaries uh, and with Becky Bond, uh, subtitle How Big Organizing Can Change Everything. Uh, before that, he was a senior advisor for digital strategy and I suppose for a lot of other things for the Bernie Sanders presidential nomination campaign. Um, way back when he was a union organizer, he was uh, the first organizing director for moveon.org. He was the founder of the New Organizing Institute. Uh, he was an advisor to Howard Dean's campaign, uh, John Kerry's digital director and online fundraising and all around digital guru. Uh, and is it, if I'm not mistaken, went from there and did Tony Blair's uh, campaign over in England. So rumor has it. So, uh, yeah. Well, Zach has been in this business for a long time, and perhaps one of the one of the most interesting things that I, I, I that I thought you did was uh, um, when you did the tour to the evangelical churches around the country and uh, and wrote a blog of your experiences of that. That was quite fascinating. So, welcome, Zach. Welcome to the Doctor Digipol Show. How are you today? Trying again. I was just saying thanks for having me on the show, and I went into uh, you went into free time warp or something. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes. Thanks for having me on. This is great. So, um, why don't we start out just by um, tell us a little bit about the book, New Rule uh, Rules for Revolutionaries. Is that a is that a yeah. title that's supposed to scare people, or is you know what do you mean by revolutionaries? <laughs> <laughs> You know, in the post-Bernie world, uh, nobody is scared by that word anymore because, uh, you know, Bernie said, hey, folks, we need a political revolution. Um, the billionaires have taken over the Republican Party. And now they've taken over the Democratic Party. And we need a political revolution to get rid of the establishments of both parties uh, that are strangling the health and the growth and the productivity of our country. And Bernie called that a political revolution. And, you know, we, uh, we have this actual, you know, revolution uh, in America, which did not start off violently. You know, the, the, uh, uh, the, the states, the states declared their independence and they elected revolutionary governments. They elected new governments democratically. And they said, Hey, we're doing this. And then the British said, okay, we're going to have a war over this. And, and then we got this constitution that gave us a way to have elections, elections every two years, presidential elections every four years. And it's really a wonderful thing. And it's, it's served us well, and we've never had any threat of coup or anything like that for our entire history. And so we, and, and you, you know, remember Jefferson said every, every generation needs to have its own revolution. And the beautiful thing that they gave us was a way to have a revolution without shooting each other up. And instead, by just having these nice, boring old elections. So it's really a wonderful system, and we just haven't been using it for these 250 years the way it was intended. So Bernie yeah. said, hey, let's use it, and let's elect a brand new government. So in, in a way, I mean, there's, there's the old um, uh, Robert Michel, um, the academic, not the... Uh, not the um, member of Congress who, who, who wrote the Iron Law of Oligarchy. He who says organization says oligarchy. And in a sense, maybe what we're seeing in what led to the need for the revolution that Bernie was calling for was this in, in, inherent, inherent move from an organiz, organized government and structure to the uh, coalesc coalescence of uh, oligarchic power, which needed to be disrupted. Yeah. Yeah, but, you know, on the campaign trail, Bernie, I can't tell you all the different ways I heard oligarchy pronounced in the different parts of the country. And oh, yeah. often there were extra, extra syllables thrown in there and all kinds of stuff. And, and uh, <laughs> yeah, so it was really interesting. I mean, oligarchy was not a word you heard thrown around all that much before the Bernie campaign either. At least I didn't. 
And uh, so, yeah, I think, I think that's a good way of, you know, naming the problem of that we're up against. And I think it's a good framework for understanding, uh, you know, the, the uh, powers, you know, that have taken over our government. So when it came to the Bernie campaign, exactly um, how were you able to translate some of these ideas, which, you know, people weren't using the word oligarchy, but the, com the, the notion of oligarchy is, is not a common household living room word. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you, how were you able to get voters, people, not just understanding the words, but fired up about these concepts? What, what was the oh, trick? They were fired up. That's the thing is I think I, you know, I think Bernie was a great messenger and he really connected with the people who were concerned with all this stuff. But I don't, I don't know if Bernie actually changed that many people's minds. You know, I think people were really already prepped. Uh, you know, they, they were angry. They were, you know, people were wondering, why has my income been going down for 40 years? You know, people's real incomes have been going down for 40 years. The, I'm sure you've seen the statistic that um, people, uh, let me see, I'm trying to remember the detail. Pe people born in... 1940, uh, almost all of them, it was like 90 something percent, grew, grew up and made way more money than their parents. And then people born in 1980 are not going to make as much as their parents. Only 40% of them are going to make as much as their parents. So there's a widespread understanding when you get outside of, you know, the these tiny little neighborhoods in a handful of big cities where rents are skyrocketing and people, everybody seems to be getting rich. When you get out of there, everybody really understands that their income's been falling. It's getting harder to make a living. It's getting harder to make ends meet. There's no question in people's minds. And, you know, and the first time we saw that was when Obama ran for president and people came out of the woodwork and they were talking about that. You know, I went to a million Obama organizing meetings all over the country and watching that whole phenomenon. And people were really angry about their, about their situation. And, and it was a much more kind of positive, hopeful campaign. You know, Obama at that time in history, it was, remember, for most of the time that he was running, it was before the big 2008 uh, bank collapse, right? So he was, he was running on this message of hope and, you know, everything is going to be wonderful. And there was so much hopeful stuff around his election, right? So it was, he ran, generally ran on this very positive message. But if you were at the organizing meetings with the volunteers for Obama, they were talking about how bad things were getting in their communities and their lives. And what I heard over and over again was we're organizing not just to make him president, but then to hold him accountable. And unfortunately, the Obama folks pulled the plug on that whole organization. So there wasn't anybody being held accountable uh, during his presidency. But same thing happened with Bernie. And I think Bernie, his tone and his message was just so, um, you know, it, it, was, it was really right there with where people were at. And I think people, uh, what I sensed at so many meetings is that people were so frustrated with the way the Bernie, um, I mean, sorry, with the way the Obama White House had played out. You know, they were like, wait a minute, where was all that hope and change? Like, we didn't get all that much of it. Uh, and, we're, and, you know, incomes are still going down. Everything is still going down. Things aren't getting better. Things aren't turning around. And so people were, I think Bernie's message was, was really right there with people's mindset. You know, and people were really ready for somebody like Bernie that was not polished and shiny, you know, but was just like telling it how it was. Well, you know, it's interesting that you say that the feelings were already out there and that Bernie was able to tap into them. And, and, and I, I think that that's, that there's a lot to that. I want to read to you a tweet that Donald Trump tweeted. Well, let's see. It's earlier this morning. Uh, mm -hmm. quote, it, was, it wasn't Donald Trump that divided the country. It, the country has been divided for a long time, stated today by the Reverend Franklin Graham. So I guess that's Billy Graham's son. Um, yeah. So Trump is making the same argument or similar argument, parallel argument, that the divisions in this country that are 
people are accusing him of having created, that they were already here. Now, you were out there talking to people. You felt mm-hmm. and you saw what the economic frustration in, that, that you just described. Were you feeling mm-hmm. the division out there at the same time? Is he right in saying that the, the divisiveness was also there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I, yeah. I mean, I think I'm actually working on this project right now, looking at that division, and there, you know, the 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 thesis I'm kind of exploring, trying to check and see whether this is real or whether it's in my head, is that America has been divided into these two fake tribes, and one is the conservative Christian tribe, and the other is the progressive secular tribe. And, but, but, but what I, you know, and so, so there's this feeling like America is divided into these two subcultures. And of course, the reality is that it's way more complex than that. Um, You know, if you look at Christians or evangelical Christians, even that's an incredibly diverse group, which for example, includes, you know, disproportionately includes African-Americans, for example, who are not conservative, right? They're not conservative, at least if you look at a, at a certain range of issues. And uh, so it's, it's a lot more complicated. But, but there's this thing where the, the, this is the, the idea I'm exploring is that the, the media, while seeking the news media, the cable news media to seek ratings, you know, namely Fox News and then kind of MSNBC, is they're they're creating an audience like fox is creating an audience um you know that they can then get ratings out of so they're playing to a certain range of political opinions but you know through that process of doing show after show after show that's targeted at, the, at this audience that supposedly exists they're also defining that audience right because they're changing the where they're changing the way their audience thinks because they're informing them of all this stuff even though it's a lot of often a lot of fake news and then you know msnbc to some degree is doing a similar thing and uh and then of course there's news rate or there's a talk radio okay but then there's also the primary process of the for within the parties and so what we just saw especially with the republican uh party is the the these you know with all those candidates the ones that came out really strong were the ones that were playing really effectively to that imagined tribe, right? conservative Christian uh, group. And, you know, so Rubio, um, Cruz, and Trump, even though Trump had a lot of fake positions, you know, designed to reach out to that tribe, um, they were they were the front runners. And they... Had, you know they they had to you know, but but think about all the all the energy that went into the Republican primary a lot of that energy what it was really doing was helping to reinforce the identity of the Republican party as being this Christian conservative thing yeah um, so yeah so I think you know I think America is divided but how much you know and I think it's getting more divided and it and and it, it in, in reality, it's divided between a thousand different subcultures, but there are these forces in the media and with the political parties that are kind of trying to corral people into these two major cultures. Because you know, if you have, it, it's easy, you know, you have to have an audience. You know, you have to. You can't speak to a thousand different audiences. I mean, Hillary Clinton kind of tried to do that and lost. They always lose doing that. And and um, you know, you you there's a natural process of you know, sort of speaking to to these audiences that you yourself create, whether you're a new network or a political party, it's just that for some reason, uh, oh, you, you know why it's really maybe gotten out of hand is that, you know, we're still coming out of the period where the Democratic and Republican parties were both coalitions. You know, like the Republican Party used to be a coalition of like Southern racists and Northern liberal you know, business types and upper middle class people. And then the Democratic Party was, um, else. was this, well, it was, yeah, it was this weird coalition of like black people and people of color and then northern worker, northern white workers. And it was very confusing. 
And, and that was an evolution of, of, a, of an earlier iteration, which was a whole nother weird combination where it was um, the Republican Party was black people in the South and business people in the North. And the Democratic Party was the Southern white racists and Northern workers. It was a whole different confusing mishmash. And so as long as you had this weird mishmash, e each party representing a mishmash of the, you know, of, of, of class positions and ethnicities, uh, then it, it was hard to see America as a bifurcated country, right? Because you had two parties that represented a range of working class and upper class people and people of color and white people. And, um, and but now, you know, in this, in, in our new alignment, uh, the two parties are um, maybe the, the coalition has become a little bit more simplified, or maybe it hasn't. I don't know. I'm still trying to think through some of this stuff. I don't know. What yeah, do you think about all that? Well, it's, it's interesting because you, you mentioned about how there are these coalitions, but yet there's these media forces that are trying to corral them into more solid blocks in a way. Um, mm -hmm. Pew uh, Journalism Project yesterday came out with uh, a report that showed that um, Fox News, among all voters, was the primary source for 19% of, vo of, of, of voters um, for their news. But that translated into 40% of Republicans who, or Trump voters considered Fox their primary source of news and only 3% of the people who voted for uh, Clinton. And um, if you, and in fact, when you look at the breakdown for Clinton, CNN, the top rated source of news for, for uh, Clinton voters only scored at 18%, a point below Fox News national right and so yeah the, fox news it, is it's a huge phenomenon it's a huge yeah. operation and, yeah. and so the clinton voters are all split up among a whole wide range of of sources whereas yeah. the Trump voters have all coalesced around a single primary unifying source of news with ancillary sources yeah but uh, yeah but it's it's not just I don't know. Somebody needs to figure out why it is that the right wing, because it's not just Fox News; it's also talk radio. You know. Yes. And there's like more people listening to talk radio, and they listen to it three, four hours a day, um, and it's all right wing. And more people are listening to that than are watching Fox News by like an order of magnitude. You know. Yes. Very so, true. Very and, true. And there's almost no progressive talk radio. And there's almost no Democratic talk radio. I mean, you know, there are a few shows, but they get hardly anybody listening. Yeah. So, um, so what, but then what, you know, why is this? And, and MSNBC, like if you compare Fox to MSNBC, Fox has this really well thought out ideology. They bang it like a drum. They're, you know, they're, they're single-minded, you know, in the drive to, you know, win everybody over to their way of thinking, um, and they know what they think. But whereas with MSNBC, I guess another thing to say is that with Fox, Fox is actually pretty radical. You know, I mean, when you when you look at what they're saying, as if it was normal, it's actually really, really radical. You know, and they just they hate the government. You know. They're openly maligning and questioning the patriotism of people just because they're Democrats and liberals. And, you know, they're, they're, they're awful, right? They worship business. They worship big business. Um, they love corporate monopolies. I mean, it's crazy, right? And then MSNBC is, is actually, like, fair and balanced, you know, in comparison. And, sure. so, you know, MSNBC, and they're... they're branded as crazy lefties. Yeah, right, 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 exactly, because of the whole Overton window thing. But but you know, but MSNBC didn't even come out for Bernie. You know, I mean I mean Fox was like championing these absolute nutcases like Cruz and Rubio and you know, right wing fanatics. Like people who would not be let anywhere near politics a mere twenty five years ago. You know, I mean Reagan would have had these guys arrested, you know, and so, and, but, but then MSNBC like thinks that Bernie is too 
wacky and crazy. And we're, you know, most of the people on MSNBC were supporting Clinton or, uh, you know, towing a kind of uh, neutral line or something. So it's, uh, you know, and I mean, you watch MSNBC, it's like, what do they believe? I, it's very hard to figure out, you know. Right. So um, let's, let's talk where, a little bit yeah. about your book, uh, okay. Rules for Revolutionaries. Um, why don't you give us a highlight of one or two of the rules that you think are, you know, the, the first place you need to hang your hat? All right. Well, number one, the, the first rule is you don't get a revolution if you don't ask for one. Meaning if you want to get a lot of people involved and you want to do big stuff and get stuff done, uh, you have to ask people to do something big. You have to give people a big vision. You have to say, hey, everybody, in 10 years, we want to be here with, you know, everybody, universal health care, um, you know, free college tuition and reformed, reformed institutions, money out of politics. We've got a big vision. Let's start fighting for it, which is exactly what Bernie did, right? Um, and everybody involved in the Bernie campaign, uh, uh, as with Obama, understood that electing him president was just one first step and that there were going to be many steps after that, you know, fighting for Congress, um, you know, fighting for state houses. So, but how do you get people involved there? You need to have a big ask that's exciting. That's worth people's time that people feel like, okay, yeah, I, this is worth me. I mean, think about all the stuff that people have to give up to participate in a campaign. They're going to see their kids less. They're going to, you know, not do that. They're not, not going to stay late and do that extra work in their new job. You know, there's a lot of real sacrifices that people have to make and it needs to be worth it. And so, you know, comparing the Clinton and the Obama, I mean, in the Bernie campaign, Bernie had a big ask. He had a big vision of something that was going to be beautiful if we could achieve it. And Clinton actually did an experiment where I walked around town with a video camera and asked people, you know, this was in the general. And I said, what does uh, Trump stand for? What does he say he stands for? And everybody said, make America great again, build a wall, bomb the crap out of ISIS. And I said, okay, what does Hillary Clinton stand for? And they literally didn't, they could not say. And, and Hillary supporter could not say what she stood for. They just knew that you know, she was not this crazy Trump person, that she was a Democrat or whatever. So, you know, Clinton wasn't asking people to make a big change, to do something big, to achieve something big. And that's why she lost in those three critical states. You know, uh, so that's rule number one. Okay. So it's interesting you say that because, his, I mean, this is deeper than just Clinton and Trump because for many, many years, a couple decades now, you could ask people on the street what a conservative stand for and they would say smaller government, less taxes, strong national defense. And if you ask them right. what, a, what, a, what a Democrat or a progressive stands for, and they wouldn't know, there would be no answer. Uh, and ironically, right. Right. Um, you know, Clinton's uh, primary advisor, John Podesta, wrote a book trying to distill uh, what progressives <laughs> believe down into five basic really? tenets. Yeah. What yeah. was it? it what was did he come up with? Um, it was like... Okay, you know, well, there's there's one problem, right? It's five tenets. So, right. fail. Well, you already failed. <laughs> but, you know, it was like, you well, know, government is a force for good. Um, um, government provides a hand up. Cooperation is better than competition. Um, you know... Uh, really? And, uh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I, I actually... I actually did, wrote a, wrote an, an essay at one point for a blog where I took his five, and it's been so long I can't re figure yeah. out, and tried to reduce it down to three or four. And, hey, there you, know, you go. And, to, and you know, because I had the same thought that that you did. You know, fewer is better. But uh, but this is a but, long. But even but even there though, the like, yeah. But even there, like, think of those things you mentioned, right? They're all like value statements, right? It, it is good to know what your values are, um, right. although government is a force for good. I don't know. I mean, is that really is that really a compelling value? Is it true even? I mean, government could be a, a force for good, but you know, I don't know. I mean, right. I think the government especially is a site of especially given you know sort of the founding fathers' notion of you know constraining government. <clears throat> um, yeah, but yeah, but also, I mean, okay, our government you know, just killed a couple of million people in the Middle East over the last, you know, since I was in college. 
And um, we have two and a half million people locked up in prison for stuff that is not considered a imprisonable offense anywhere else in the world, like not in China, not in Russia. You know, um, we have two and a half million people in prison. India, with 1.4 billion people, has 200,000 people in prison, and they're starting to freak out about it because and calling it mass incarceration. And the U.S. has two and a half million people in prison, and and uh, there's, we have nine million people that are either in prison or have the ankle bracelets on, where they have to report to. Most yuppies don't even know about this, but there's like. Six million people in America that have, that have ankle bracelets that are connected to their homes that make sure that they're home at night. So, so we let we let these folks out of prison so that they can go to work in a factory all day, and then they need to be home. So they're under house arrest basically when they're not at work. And when I worked in factories as a labor organizer, I I, I know you know I was a kid from the suburbs, and I was like, what is that on your ankle? You know and <laughs> And they're like, really? And like a quarter of the people in the factory seemed to have these ankle bracelets on at any given time. It was crazy. It was a minimum wage, you know, sweatshop kind of factory. And, okay, so is government a force for good? You know, I mean, really? That's you a, know, that's and, a good point. <laughs> and uh, you know, so I don't know. I mean, I think, I think government is a site of struggle. And there's a lot of different interests in our society, and 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 these different interests are duking it out. And government is one of the playing fields on which we're duking it out, and we've been losing. And so I think more and more government has become a, a force for bad, actually. But okay, but here's the point. But Trump, but Trump's, Trump's. Think about those things. Everything that Trump said was a verb, right? Make America great again. Build a wall. You know, I'm going to build factories in your town. That's what he said to all the people in Michigan. Um, and they're going to be beautiful factories, right? And the best. And um, he's going to bomb ISIS. He's going to bomb ISIS. Like, what was Clinton's strategy for? I mean, I, don't, I really don't like that strategy. But, but whatever Clinton's strategy was for fighting terrorism, I don't think there was a verb in it. And, and everybody knew that she was going to go bomb ISIS too, right? And she's right. Probably, everybody knew she was probably more likely to go, you know, bomb ISIS and others. So, um, you know, I, I actually, like, one of Clinton's big things was a no-fly zone in Syria. You know, okay, a no-fly zone in Syria. Um, Trump was going to, you know, which is more likely to get us into World War Three because... There's a lot of Russian planes that are going to be flying through that no-fly zone. And Trump was going to bomb the crap out of ISIS. So, of course, people are going to vote for Trump. And yeah. nevertheless, I mean, Americans are so level-headed that they actually voted for Clinton with a 3 million right, with, vote with margin. Right, with surplus, right? So yeah. would, you, would it be fair to say that Trump was asking people to come along on his revolution? Yes. And I actually think that he would have won in a landslide if he had just been a normal person. You know what I mean? You mean like, same, same platform, but without yeah. the eccentricities. Yeah. Like, yeah, without the, you know, bragging about assaulting women, you know, without, you know, all the dozens of really credible allegations of rape, without, uh, you know, staying up until 6 a.m. tweeting about Miss Universe after the first debate. Remember that one? Yes. And, <laughs> which is, you know, we thought was the most bizarre thing that could ever happen, but then it got more and more bizarre. You know, without siding with Putin in, like, every, you know, without all that stuff. And also, I think, without the talk of deporting um, 11 million of our neighbors and um, without the Islamophobia. I actually think that all those things were things that kept people from voting for, for him just as much or more than they turned out voters. And, and you know. What are your thoughts I mean, Because about he did get fewer votes than, you know, like in those swing states, for example, in those key states, he got fewer votes than Mitt Romney or George Bush. Right. There just were fewer votes to go around overall. Well, the, yeah, right. Yeah. What are your thoughts about 
him continuing to tweet as president. Well, this was our nightmare, right? Is when we were inventing this whole math, internet, direct, you know, direct to voter thing. We, you know, like after the Kerry campaign, it was like, what's, you know, because everybody thought Kerry was going to win within the campaign, same thing. And they were like, we, you know, it was like, well, what's he going to do with this list? And what we realized was he wasn't going to do anything with the list. Like he was done with his supporter base Kerry. the minute he got elected. Yeah. I mean, first of all, you know, he didn't. Um, it was the same with, and it was the same with Obama. It turned out that Obama was completely done with his supporter base the minute he got elected. Uh, and and some of us thought this was a great tragedy, and we worked to convince these people that they should actually do something with their supporter base, like govern, you know, and and work towards passing things like. Healthcare reform, you know, and so instead of leaning on that mass movement that Obama created to work for truly transformational healthcare reform, instead he acted like he didn't have any popular support and went begging to the Republicans in the insurance industry and came up with this ridiculous Obamacare system. So, um, you know, so imagine if Obama had led with his base. Well, that's exactly what Trump is doing. And so Trump, you know, Obama came in with a major Democratic majority in Congress and let it slip away, right? So what is Trump doing with his Republican majority? He's telling them that if they don't get with his exciting, verb-laden program, you know, then, then uh, and if they start going around and around about some complicated healthcare plan that they're going to replace Obamacare with. And if they start wheeling and dealing with the insurance industry, like this amazing thing that Trump was saying, we're going to replace Obamacare and we're going to replace it with something cheap and that covers everybody. That's so brilliant. Right. So um, they need, you know, so, and he says he's going to use his Twitter supporters, his Twitter following to whip the Republicans to do that. And he says that if Paul Ryan doesn't follow, he's going to just beat them all up with uh, his online supporters. He's, and he's talking about using them like a weapon. And, and the thing is, Trump intuitively understands. Right. And this is the first time, this is the first time since, well, I, I was gonna say Andrew Jackson, but I guess this is the first time since Roosevelt that we've had a mass movement leader in the White House. So, and he's so a really me, scary one. So at the risk of putting on the spot, to what extent do you think Bernie is using his followers to counter what's happening from the Trump side. Well, I'm sorry to say, but Bernie is not a mass movement leader in the same way Trump is. Bernie is a stump speech giver, and he gives a great stump speech. And in the context of a presidential campaign, you know, the campaign was able to mobilize a huge number of people around Bernie's stump speech. But Bernie does not develop a direct, you know, tactical, strategic uh, relationship with a base of supporters. He just doesn't do that. That's not his thing. Right. He, he, he's not one of the people who can do that or who wants to do that. And so he's just kind of letting other people lead the base, and, but nobody really is. And so we don't, really, we don't have a mass movement right now that's being led or directed. Uh, which I think is a real shame. Right. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Well, I want to be mindful of your of your time. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, give, give you an opportunity just for a final comment. We've got an inauguration tomorrow. Closing thoughts before we say uh, goodbye for now. Well, it's going to be crazy. Who knows where this is all going to go? It's going to be a wild ride. This is going to be very interesting. And um, I don't know. I we do need somebody to step up and lead. Uh, so if you're out there, person with the skills to lead another mass movement, please get cracking on that. Well, um, <laughs> I, 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 I hear you, and, and uh, as they say, from from your lips to God's ears. 